Welcome to the Allegheny East Conference of Churches. Hey everyone, we're so glad that you're here with us again on these days that we're going to be undefeated. We're going to make sure that all of our youth and as we listen to our presenters, Pastor Abraham Henry and Sister Claudia, as we delve into being undefeated. We want to be sure that as you listen to these sermons that you get engaged, you share it with somebody, you chat, you shout, you scream, whatever it is that you're feeling as you hear the word come, just do it and say it in the chat. Now remember, come back again as we do our morning and evening services so that you will always be blessed. Undefeated. Let us pray. Speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, give your servant the words that will bring new life. We're praying, O oh Lord, that you will hover over every listener, wherever they may be. Prepare our hearts and our minds so that uh, we may be receptive to what you have spoken to and through your servant, O oh God. Help us, Lord, so that we may be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Bless your servant. Give him the power, and the courage to speak boldly of the things of God. We thank you, O Lord. Amen. together with one agenda and it is you alone one agenda and it is you alone one agenda and it is you alone even so Change our vision 
Hey everybody, the youth ministry department has connected to it, the young adult ministries. And in young adult ministries, we always looked at it as part of the youth ministries, but now we kind of want to split it up just a little bit so that we could focus on the young adults who are in our conference. We want you to know that we have done a soft launch as uh, we push forward events, programming, uh, ministries for young adults. We have set aside a gentleman named Robert Harris who's going to be leading in our federation making sure that this happens. We have full support from administration and we know that uh, we have even on from the North American division we have help in pushing this ahead. As a couple of months will pass by you will see us start to build this little by little. We believe that our young adults of course are part of our church and we want you those of you who are beginning, coming out of college, even with your families together, young families together, we need you to be a part of it. So please, listen out. Get us on AEC, visit AEC.org and go to Youth Ministries. You will find our soft launch that's going to be there. Stay close with us as we start to build our young adult ministries together. Anyway, Patrick Graham here. God bless you real good.
my heart is filled with praise my heart is filled with praise good evening i am so glad to be back. Now, listen, we're going to get right into it. This evening, the Lord has sent me to tell you that you can do nothing by yourself. I, I will give you our entire study in one short sentence. An undefeated life requires undefeated alliances. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 17. We will begin at verse 1 and read verse 13. Read 2 verse 13, Exodus chapter 17, 1 through 13. I'll read in your hearing from the Christian Standard Bible. The word of the Lord declares that the entire Israelite community left the wilderness of sin, moving from one place to the next according to the Lord's command. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink. Why are you complaining to me? Moses replied to them. Why are you testing the Lord? But the people thirst there for water. And so they grumbled against Moses and they said, why did you ever bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock of thirst? A little dramatic. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? In a little while, they will stone me. And so the Lord answered Moses, he said, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take the staff you struck the Nile with in your hand and go. I am going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. When you hit the rock, water will come out of it and the people will drink. Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites complained. And because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? At Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Moses and Joshua select some men for, uh, for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. And Joshua did as Moses had told him. And they fought against Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on the top of the hill. Now while Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. We've talked about undefeated hope, and we've talked about undefeated faith. This evening, we're going to talk about undefeated alliances. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are here. You are with us. You are speaking. Guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The truth is we have a lot of friends, but can those friends, do those friends truly support us when we are dealing with a variety of situations? Do you have people in your circle, in your corner, that when you are trying to uh, be undefeated in the battles that God has called you to, that they will raise you up? Well, verse 1 tells us that the children of Israel camped in Rephidim, but now... My degrees are in English literature and language, so I have to speak to what this phrase is communicating. But is what we call a conjunction family. A conjunction joins words or phrases together and indicates the relationship between the elements joined. So conjunction, junction, what's your function? In, in the phrase, the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin and camped in Rephidim, but 
there was no water for the people to drink. The conjunction but is functioning as what we call a coordinating conjunction. Just tap somebody, just tap, tap your neighbor, tap your daddy, tap your mama, tap your sibling, the person you sitting next to right now, just let them know but is functioning as a coordinating conjunction. Now stay with me, I'm going somewhere. A coordinating conjunction seeks to combine two ideas that are of equal importance together. So in Exodus 17, one, the writer is saying that it's important that you know that the children of Israel camped in Rephidim, but it's also important for you to know that there was no water there. Now, why is this important for you to know? Well, Rephidim is a Hebrew word meaning rest or stay. And this evening, I find it necessary to make you aware of this definition and the grammatical, the grammatical use of the coordinating conjunction, but because as we see in the text, the Israelites find the essence of the word Rephidim to be contradictory to their current condition. <laughs> now, journeying out of the wilderness of sin, the Israelites thought that they ended up in a place of rest. They thought that they ended up in a place where they could find stability and permanence, but instead they found themselves in a place that lacked the very thing that was necessary for them to live water. Now see when the writer placed the coordinating conjunction, but in the phrase, he made us aware of the fact that the Israelites were currently attempting to rest and stay in a place called rest and stay. That was not conducive to their rest or stay. In other words, the Israelites were in a place whose very name seemed contradictory to what was promised them. Tired from their journey out of the wilderness of sin, the thing they craved the most, their place of rest, their place of stay, was unable to provide them. This oasis, this place of rest and stay in name only lacked the very main ingredient necessary for human rest and stay, water. And the truth the truth of the matter is many of us know what it feels like to be in a place that should be able to give you rest and should be able to nourish you. But the fact of the matter is it lacks the very water that you need. Oh, come on, come, 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 come. See, you tuned in to the virtual church, but you couldn't connect spiritually. You committed to that relationship, but it only made you more thirsty. Ah, help me hear somebody. You turned to your job or school school or work and you still feel empty. You tried to feed it with drugs or alcohol or sex, but you still feel unsatisfied. In other words, you've been in Rephidim and you've not gotten the rest or the nourishment that you've needed, that you were promised, that this particular place and station uh, suggests it's capable of providing for you. And so as we see in verse two, the people continue with Moses and they say, give us water that we may drink. And see, now I want you to really understand the frustration of the children of Israel. See, all of us end up in the wilderness of sin. Oh, I'm going to help somebody tonight. This vast place and this time where we were walking in sin and falling in sin and drinking in sin and eating in sin and laughing in sin and talking in sin and thinking in sin and singing in sin. And when you get out of that place. You crave that which Jesus promised the woman at the well. You crave life. You crave water. You've been thirsting for a very long time and you need that thirst to be quenched. So you have to understand the Israelites frustration. Don't be so quick to condemn and judge them. See, they've been thirsting for a while and they have come to a place whose very name promises that this is an environment. This is a location. This is a place that is conducive to their rest and stay. Rephidim. They are coming out of a journey, constant movement, lack of resources to maintain and sustain their life. And they're seeking some place to rest and stay. And they come to Rephidim and there's no water. What this story teaches us is that sometimes God has to put us in contradictory situations in order to break us of our dependence on everything but him. 
See, Rephidim teaches us that the greatest undefeated alliance you can have is with God himself. Because see, when you align yourself with God, he can't help but work on your benefit. Oh, can I get an amen? I see you right there. You shouting. You should be shouting right there. You need to be shouting right there at that point that God is your first and most important alliance. So jump down with me to verse five and six. God himself commands Moses. He says, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand, your rod with you which you struck the river and go see behold i will stand before you on the rock in horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it and the people will drink. See, what I see in this verse is that God does not simply provide the children of Israel with water. Instead, he is the water from which the children of Israel drink. Look at the text with me, y'all. God is standing in front of of the rock. Moses is not striking the rock. He's striking God himself. And see, when you form an alliance with God, he will position himself in front of the very barriers that are keeping you from having life and life more abundantly. And he will allow you to go as far as to strike him so that you can get what you need. See, the first and most important alliance you need when your location and your condition are not conducive to your livelihood. <laughs> is an alliance with God because God will become what you need to live. God will turn himself into the very thing that you need uh, to provide for you. You don't need God to make something happen. You need God to be the very thing. And see, while Rephidim seemed to lack water and therefore seemed as though it was not a place that the Israelites could stay and find any kind of permanence. See, Rephidim also did not provide the Israelites with much rest. Come on back to the text with me. We read it a little bit earlier. If you notice in verse eight, the writer tells us that the Amalekites came to fight the Israelites. <laughs> Well, in Rephidim. So imagine this. The Israelites, they are coming out of the wilderness of sin, thirsty and exhausted. And so they go into a town named Rest and Stay and find that not only is there no water for their stay, but now they have to go into battle and therefore they cannot rest. How frustrating is that? The place where I'm experiencing rest and stay has done nothing but take from me and force me into battle with people while I'm in an unnourished and uh, drained state. The very place that's supposed to be pouring into me right now is simply taking and destroying and attacking and killing. But now we also understand why God allowed the children of Israel to come into such a place because it, while it seems like a contradiction, God knew that the children of Israel would go into battle. He knew that they would face the Amalekites. And so he had to teach them total dependence on him with water so that they'd have total dependence on him in battle. <laughs> See, some of us are coming out of the wilderness of sin and we don't understand why it seems that God has led us to places that don't seem to be conducive to our livelihood. And God is trying to get us to a point where we stop asking him to give us what we need and we instead start believing God to be what we need. Just like getting water out of the rock, God knows that there's a battle we're going to have to fight in the near future. And if we keep asking him to give us what we need, instead of asking him to be what we need, we're not going to win the battle that's on the way. And if you are going to be undefeated in the battles that God has called you to fight, you shouldn't be asking God for the things that you need. You need to be asking God to be the things that you need. Be my peace, God. Be my food. Be my drink. Be my protector. Be my provision. God, be everything that I need. And see, there's a difference. We, we, when you have God be everything that you need, there's a difference in fighting for him and fighting with him. See, when you fight for God, you're attempting to do what he asked you to do in your own strength, my God. But see, when you fight with God, you're doing what he asked you to do in his strength. Now, now the people of God, close, not the closest to you, they will either encourage you to fight with God or they'll encourage you to fight for God. 
And see, Rephidim is the place where God teaches you that you cannot do anything, what? By yourself. See, Rephidim is where you learn that you need godly alliances. Rephidim is where you learn that undefeated battles are won with an undefeated God and undefeated alliances. Now, a godly alliance is a small group of people who hold you up while the power of God works through you, causing you to prevail in purpose. Let's go to the verse. Verse 10 through 13, the word of the Lord says that when Moses' hands were up, the Israelites started started to win the battle. But when Moses became tired and his hands and arms began to fall, the Israelites started to lose the battle. Now this is critical. See, ungodly alliances won't notice that God's power is moving in your favor when you do certain things. They don't look for patterns in God's power. All they'll see, even in their best intentions, is your fatigue. They will see your physical exhaustion. They'll see your mental exhaustion. They'll see your intellectual exhaustion. They'll see your emotional exhaustion. They'll see your physical, uh, your spiritual exhaustion, but they will not see why rest, my God, is unacceptable. See, ungodly alliances will encourage you to rest in a place where God has called you to fight because ungodly alliances cannot see how the power of God is moving in a particular pattern to manifest victory within your purpose. So because they're all blinded to the power of God, they'll encourage you to take breaks from the purpose of God, not realizing that while you're on break, you're losing the battle and see ungodly alliances encourage you to rest because because ungodly alliances care more about your present comfort than your long-term victory. I'm going to say that again. Ungodly alliances care more about your present comfort than your long-term victory. But see, godly alliances, <laughs> they are the exact opposite family. See, they don't let you take breaks. They don't let you rest even when you're in refidim. <laughs> even when you are in a place and time when you should get rest. Godly alliances recognize that God's purpose is more important than your present expectations. God's purpose is more important than your condition. God's purpose is more imp important than your desires. So when God calls you to fight in Rephidim, godly alliances don't encourage you to rest in Rephidim. Godly alliances are able to see that your fight is purposed, that your fight is powered by God, so that when you get weary in Rephidim, godly alliances hold you up. When you start to lose battles in Rephidim, godly alliances pray you up. When you start to lose battles in Rephidim, godly alliances participate in your fight to help take off some of the heavy load, hey? God, when you start losing battles in Rephidim, godly alliances will rearrange your environment so that you can win. This is how you are going to be victorious in the battles that God has purposed for your life. You being comfortable and rested is irrelevant. See, God is calling you to fight battles when you're tired and thirsty. God is going to call you to fight battles when it seems that you're at your weakest and most vulnerable. Why? Because when you are victorious, you'll stand and say it was not by might, nor by power, but by the spirit of God. When you're victorious, you'll stand and say it was not I, but Christ living in me. When you're victorious, you'll stand and say I was victorious because two or three gathered and God has promised was there in the midst. God calls us to fight battles when we are at our weakest, our most vulnerable, and our most insecure. Because when we are victorious, we will always remember that victory was secured, not by my knowledge, not by my skill, not by my strength, but by the work of my godly alliance. Moses' godly alliance was made up of three parts. His godly alliance was made up of God himself, it was made up of Aaron, and it was made up of her. And what I want you to sit with and wrestle with this evening is who is in your godly alliance? 
God is the power and the provision in your godly alliance. Aaron and her are the support in your godly alliance. So that means that you've got to find some people that when your mind, your body, and your spirit are failing, and all you want to do is rest and stay, all you want to do is feed and drink, they are the people that will change your environment on your behalf so that you are in the best position to pursue success in your purpose and they are in the best position to support you in that pursuit they sat Moses down on the rock and got on one side of him and lifted up his arms who are your Aaron and her who are the people that while you are in the midst of battle will hold you up so that you can continue to be undefeated Finally, what's awesome about Rephidim is that Rephidim is really not a contradiction. Even though this desert oasis lacked water, causing the Israelites to believe it was not a place they could permanently set up camp. And even though this was where they fought the Amalekites, so it seemed as though it was not a place where they received rest. Rephidim lived up to its name because God was with them. Rephidim was not rest and stay because the circumstances or the conditions were inherently conducive to such. No, Rephidim was rest and stay because the very essence and nature of God is rest and stay. Rephidim was rest and stay because God is Jehovah Jireh. He is provision and he's Jehovah Gador Michama. He is mighty in battle. See, we can stay and rest in Rephidim because God is in Rephidim. And even though our circumstances might not seem to be conducive to our livelihood, and as, as long as God is present, we will be provided for. We will have the rest we need. We will experience victory in the things that God has pr- uh, purposed for us to accomplish. But we've got to accept that we cannot do this thing called life on our own. We need the power and provision of God, and we need the support of a God. Godly alliance. Why must we operate in such community, Claudia? Because the fact of the matter is, none of us can prevail in the purpose of God unless we partner with his posse. None of us can be undefeated in this Christian life unless we are connected with a godly alliance. I can't emphasize this anymore. The very thing that you are trying to accomplish is a season in your life where God is going to call you into drought. He's going to call you into battle. He's going to call you into difficulty and test. Not when you're your strongest, but when you're at your weakest, when you're old, when you're tired, when you're drained, when you're depressed, when you're weak, when you're weary, when it seems as though everybody is against you, when it appears as though uh, you have no one. And it's in that moment where the test of who your true friends are is critical. Because everything that God has created and called you to do, everything that God has created and called you to be, requires that at some point, some people are going to have to switch up your environment. They're going to have to move some things around in your space on your behalf. And they're going to need to be the kind of people that are willing to get on either side of you and hold you up so that you remain undefeated until the battle is over. God God needs us to have undefeated alliances. People that are not easily swayed, people that are not easily uh, mesmerized, people that are not yes people, people that are not uh, 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 just simply trying to be close to you, but rather people that love you at the core of your being. People who see the power and the pattern of God working and moving inside of you. And so they 
come and say, Claudia, we're going to hold you up until the battle is over. That's how we remain undefeated with an undefeated alliance. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, God, we are grateful to you that you are committed to being first and foremost in our undefeated alliance. Right now, God, I pray and ask for every person that might be listening to this broadcast. And God, my prayer is that you lead and guide them to the people that are their Aaron and her. God, you are our provision and you are our protection and you are the thing that absolutely everything that we need. But God, there are times when we need people who are our support. And so in the name of Jesus, I pray and ask that you lead and guide each and every person that watches this to come in contact with the people that are God ordained to stand beside them and hold them up while they are in the midst of their battle, that they might be able to prevail and they might be able to remain undefeated, that they might be able to accomplish absolutely everything you have called and purposed them to do, not because they are capable in their own strength, but God, because of your strength and because of their support. God, we are thankful for the godly alliances that you have formed and the godly alliances that you will form. And we pray that you just continue to get the glory and the honor in absolutely everything that we do and say. It's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.